had a great opportunity to speak with author and fellow podcaster Jeff Dalton from Agile CXO. And in his new book, Great Big Agile, he shares his unique and powerful approach to executing, spreading, and scaling agility. That's this week on the Badass Agile Podcast. Greetings, team. Welcome to the Badass Agile Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Williams. So I, I just been, uh, I guess we could start with, I'm, I'm curious about Badass Agile and, and the name and what it's all about. Why don't we start with that? Sure. So I had uh, grown up you know, in the technology industry, I was a trainer for Microsoft for the longest time and, and, uh, and strangely didn't come across agile that way, even though I'd become an executive of consulting firms and had gone through the, the process of being a developer, project manager, kind of the normal trajectory. I actually spent three years in an academy called Unbeatable Mind, which is run by ex Navy SEALs on, you know, how they think and perform and lead. And it was there that I learned a bunch of principles that once I started examining Agile, I realized they were the same thing. Right. And so started getting into things like self-defense and boxing and became a boxing instructor for a while. And, and in the process of doing that, having gone through school for things like I'd been to opera school at one point, I'd been, you know, I've been a guitar player since I was like seven years old. All of these principles kind of came together. And what I realized is that success in any field requires certain mindsets and behaviors. And not unlike the kinds of things that are in your book, which I'm anxious to talk about as well. But the, the, at the end of the day, if we're waiting for large organizations to lead agile properly, using the kind of thinking that got them to where they are, it's, we're probably going to struggle. What's required is emergent leadership at the team level. The problem is that if team members don't feel empowered to make those changes, we're never going to get anywhere with Agile. So what we needed was like a dirty, hairy concept of a, a guy or gal who could emerge as someone who exhibited those principles of being visionary, of being gritty, right. of never quitting, of putting the team first, of doing the most important thing first, of continuously inspecting and adapting your own personal and team game. If we could bring out a group of leaders at the team level who do that by example, then Agile change can and will flow more naturally. Um, so that's where the principle of badass agile came from, and I've just been riffing on it ever since, really. Well, that's really interesting, and I, I, I knew we shared some uh, things in common, but I didn't realize how much. Uh, you know, I, I was a classical music major in college, hmm. and uh, my son is an opera major, so um, I, I know that I know the industry well. I, I played in orchestras for for decades before I even got into what I do now. And um, I think you're right on. I, um, I've written a, f a few papers about the, the parallels between orchestras and music, especially jazz and, and agile. Right on. Uh, and how that, you know, that empowerment and that self-organization is so critical for any artist. Uh, you also brought up martial arts, which I thought was cool. Mm -hmm. there, I, I don't know if you read uh, Jim Bouchard. Uh, he's an author that um, has a series of books called Think Like a Black Belt. No, I heard I heard of the book. Then the author's name doesn't ring a bell. Yeah, he's a terrific guy. He's out of Portland, Maine, um, and you know, to hear him talk, he sounds like you and I. He's like, you know, it's empowerment, respect, self organization, discipline, and you know, one one peeve of mine, or not peeve, I guess, but one one thing I'm passionate about is 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 um, you know craftsmanship, and I don't mean you know the the sort of cold craftsmanship movement that's popular now which is great. I'm, I'm glad we have that. It's, it's all around craftsmanship. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Jim talks about discipline and, and expertise and, and commitment and just being really great at what you do is a prerequisite for any kind of really solid agile uh, organization. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a terrific book. You might want to check it out. I will. Uh, but yeah, the, the parallels in music are super interesting. It's um you know, if you look at what it takes for a, an artist to become an artist, it requires, you know, first an understanding of fundamentals and skills. And, and what concerns me when I look across a lot of agile organization is, you know, they're, they're going through some motions. A lot of companies, they're doing stand-ups, they're doing sprint demos, they're doing some of the things that sort of Scrum prescribes, but they're, they're not really being agile, are they? 
No, no. And this is where it gets interesting because I want to talk about the concepts in your book. So can we go there? Is that, can we dig in? Oh, that'd be great. Go ahead, man. All right. So, so great, big agile. I love the book. First of all, congratulations. And everyone needs to read this. And here's why the thing that most organizations don't get, I feel, and I fear is that in order to do agile at scale in the large enterprise space, there's this there's this mindset that first we have to plan or buy a framework, which I think is wrong, not because the frameworks are wrong, but because to me, big upfront planning is anti-agile. So right. There's, right off the bat, there's something not quite right there. Number two, what where agility tends to fail and all of the industry papers and stats and reports reflect this, that it's either lack of leadership support or just the wrong mindset adoption. But realistically, in my view, it's that they don't allow teams to self-organize. Right. The whole principle behind Agile should be that teams will find the right form of Agile if you just let them be free to do so, which sounds terrifying. But in reality, if you look at your book, so Great Big Agile, for, for my listeners who don't know yet, it, it's centered around a whole bunch of performance uh, circles, as you call them. And those performance circles contain something that you call a number of holons, which I'm going to ask you to explain that whole philosophy in a minute. But they're right. like a grouping of related actions and outcomes that are done progressively. So it's almost like think of these big buckets that you as an organization can fill when you're ready, when you're understanding, when you're mature. As you roll, you can enhance and develop and mature your practice. But there is no one big upfront plan or readiness or thing you have to buy. So it, to me, it's evolutionary. In fact, all of your actions, if you're reading the books, uh, if you're reading the book, guys, you'll notice that the actions and outcomes are progressive. So you have action 1.0, action 2.0, and then you have outcomes at the, uh, forgive me for getting the names wrong, but it's almost like at the adoption level, right. then at the execution level, the steady state level, and then at the mastery level. So right. everything, everything evolves as you grow and no one hole on or performance circle is more important than the other. They all right. feed off of each other. So can you explain how you got to that philosophy and sure. why you think it's so important? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. And thank you very much. That was, that was a very, you've obviously read it. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we wanted, I wanted to depict uh, an ecosystem in a way that wasn't linear so, you know, we think about process and, you know, we think about behaviors and they're all, they're very difficult to depict in two dimensions. So when you see like a, like a description of how a process should work or how a framework should work, it's always depicted in two dimension, do this, do this, do that, do this. Right. Um, but that's not how agile works, is it? Uh, agile is much more empirical and, you know, we say sort of loosely it's iterative and incremental and, and that's cool. Mm -hmm. but nobody really gives it that object oriented view. Uh, right. And that's how I think about it, it's a, you know, I was a programmer like yourself and it, it's a, it's a class library that uh, you instantiate objects under your project, but these are behavioral objects yeah. and you call for and receive the assistance of those objects when you need them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was kind of an object oriented freak in the eighties and, and kind of, you still use that language in a lot of things that I do. So we decided that we didn't want to, uh, depict any of this as a linear behavior. We wanted to make it a series of actions that were available for your use to use within an ecosystem so that you could be successful with Agile, be self-empowered, be self-organizing, and have the tools you needed to do that. Right. So, uh, the notion of a halon is, uh, halon's a, a Greek word that, that refers to an entity that um, can live in, and stand on its own, but also can integrate with other things to produce a greater whole. Um, so an example of a halon, a simple example might be a cell in your body where it, it lives and, and has its own life, but it also interacts naturally with other components in your body to, to make your body successful, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is the idea of the halons in the APH that the performance circles are kind of the big buckets of here's the behavioral areas that are important to us. And those are things like, you know, you've read the book, leadership and, yeah. and craftsmanship and, mm -hmm. and this important buckets of, of behavioral work. And then the halons are the, the individual things that have to happen for that behavior to be exhibited. So each performance circle has between two and four halons. So for instance, our, our leading performance circle um, has within it halons for engaging with teams and empowering teams and providing vision 
um, and self-organizing vision. And then the actions within each halam describe the behaviors that you might, um, you might see exhibited in a successful organization. Um, and you know, the, the thing that inspired me to, to put that model together was, you know, I've been doing assessments of organizations for many years. It's a business I've been in for at least 20 years. One thing I've observed is that, um, especially leaders just don't know how it works sometimes. Uh, you know, a, a leader doesn't necessarily know what actions are required. I mean, you, you say empowerment, self-organization. You know, we've been using these words since 1980, right? Right. And you ask uh, any leader what that means, and they really have a hard time describing it, don't they? They, they really have a hard mm -hmm. time really putting their finger on what does self-organization mean? What does empowerment mean? And so I wanted to define it, at least what I thought it meant. Mm -hmm. And put it in a series of actions. And then I wanted to put it in an evolutionary path and say, okay, if you're just starting out uh, with, with this approach and you really want to change your organization, here's how you get started. And that's what we call that adopting level. It's like, here's the basics. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, we move those actions to what we call the transforming level, which is, okay, we're on our path. And then of course the, the mastering level. And if you're a martial artist, you're familiar with the shuhari, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote a paper years ago about uh, the shuhari as an interesting parallel for um, for growth in an organization. So, for those of you that that don't know what the shuhari is, it's it's an evolutionary path of learning in in martial arts that's that's quite popular. And, you know, Shu is a, a student level, someone who's learning and learning the forms and learning the discipline. But one of the dangers of the Shu level, of course, is that you think you know everything because you don't know, don't know, right? Right. And then the Ha level is, okay, I finally realized that I have a lot to learn and I need to, to really get better at what I do and improve performance. And then the re-level, of course, is the, the mastering level, which is endless. There's many levels of mastering. Right. So... We, we didn't want to use Shuhari in the book, but I did want to have an evolutionary path. So that thought process is part of the adopting, the transforming, and the mastering. And, and those levels uh, occur across uh, all six performance circles in all Holland. So it's pretty comprehensive if you go through the book. It's, you know, there's a couple of things, you know, you've written books, so you know that it, after it's all done, you're like, wow, I should have done this. I should have done yeah. that. So there's definitely a new version coming out next year, but it's for now it's it's a pretty good uh, comprehensive view of, of how to get started leading agile organizations. That it is. And for listeners, here's what you need to know is that a lot of the competing frameworks. So at this point we have you know, safe and nexus and less and things of that nature. One of the problems we're getting into in the agile atmosphere is that we're saying, no, this is the framework that gets it right. So right. look at the other frameworks and put big black X's next to these concepts because they don't work. What I really enjoy about your book is that at no point does it say that any of those practices are negated or not useful. In fact, the back half of your book is a gigantic lexicon of 68 or so ceremonies and artifacts, some of which are very scrum, like backlog grooming is in there in retrospect. Right. But so is open space, which is not related to Scrum, but is considered agile friendly or agile capable. Right. So you have this great big menu of every possible technique from big room planning to, you know, open OST that teams should know how to use, but you can adopt and bring in as needed. So the way the book works for listeners who don't have it yet is that it shows you those performance circles and the holons, and it says to achieve this or to start working with this, here are the techniques that you may use. But at no point is it so prescriptive that it says, first do this, then do this. And if you skip a step, you lose. Yeah, you know, it's funny. We, um, I almost didn't put that second or that section three in that you're describing uh, because I didn't want to be prescriptive. Uh, that's one right. of the, obviously, one of the complaints with Agile Frameworks is like SAFE, for instance, it's just way too prescriptive for a lot of people. And, but then I realized that a lot of people just don't know, you know, what I call the how ability layer. Yes. Like, how do I do this? You know, everybody, all these frameworks are what ability frameworks. So I, I, 
you know, I trifurcate frameworks in, in three levels, uh, why, what, and how. So why ability, what ability, and how ability, and, and frameworks like SAFE and Nexus and, and even non-natural frameworks like CMMI and ISO and so forth, they're what ability models. Hey, do this, do this, do this. But what they don't do is describe the behavior that you might see. Right. Um, and so what I did in that section is um, I had an artist draw a picture of what the technique or ceremony looks like while you're doing it. Mm-hmm. And then because because literally a lot of the leaders that I work with wouldn't recognize it if they saw it. Right. right. So we said, this is what an open space looks like. So this is, and they're simple drawings. I mean, you've seen them, they're kind of cartoonish, but, and then I follow that up with, here's the people who would probably be in attendance in this meeting and here's the outcomes and, and here's the basic you know, framework of how this ceremony or technique works. Mm-hmm. Just sort of grew from there. But, but I think you're right. I mean, going back to the music metaphor we were talking about earlier, I was always the guy in the orchestra who wanted to bring in the banjo player, right? Right. <laughs> or, you know, bring in the jazz trumpeter to play with the symphony, right. uh, really into fusion. And, you know, I, I don't really subscribe to any Agile framework, mostly because they're all incomplete. Right. Um, you know, I love Scrum and I use it in my company, but, you know, there isn't a company in the world that has, you know, three roles and six ceremonies. Right, exactly. And, and you know, as, as much as I, uh, I wish this weren't true, I've never, and out of 200 companies I've assessed, um, I've never met a Scrum team that didn't have a project manager. Mm-hmm. Uh, 100%. And, and I, don't, I don't know if that's a good thing, you know, the good or bad thing. So, yeah. so the conclusion I came to on all of that was that um, Agile isn't about techniques, right? It's not about Scrum. Lots of people who use Scrum are not Agile, right? Absolutely. And and if you want to be a waterfallish kind of, you know, linear process company, you could be Agile. It's not easy, but I mean, you could still subscribe to Agile values and, and be self-organizing and maybe not do so much big planning up front. But sure, if you if you wanted to not use Scrum or XP or something, you can still be Agile. So that was that was kind of how I got started on it because I was like, hey, wait a minute. Agile is not about these things. Agile is about you know, values and behavior and culture. Exactly. So let, let's talk about two things that I think you're passionate about, if I'm not wrong. One we've already talked about, which is music. And you're, you're a bass player, right? That's right, yeah. And so you play double bass or electric bass or both? Or? I, uh, I play double bass and electric bass. That's right, right yeah. Okay. So there's that. And then you're, you're an instrument-rated pilot, if I read correctly. That's right, yeah. Okay. So I think that orchestration and flight are both similar in the sense that you can't really fly a plane if the only technique you've learned so far is how to push and pull the stick or, you know, right. how to play a scale. At some point, the performance requires that you integrate all of the different, what you would call, pylons, right? bring them together in a way that you have a certain level of competence. And that level of competence is obviously growing and growing and growing. And there's a certain... You know, there's a certain point at which you wouldn't want to be below that line and, and executing flight. Like they won't let you, you have to be certified. Right. What, what, are right. your thoughts, what are your thoughts on certification and how to get started? Because much like flight and like orchestration or playing in a band, you can't just do one thing and one thing well and expect your agile journey as a large enterprise to go well. So how can a person use this book in your view? Assuming that they've just maybe, you know, they're new to Agile, they've been doing it, maybe they have the certification, the two-day CSM, maybe they don't, maybe they're safe right. practitioners, maybe they're not. How do they grab this book and start using the wisdom? Right. So, you know, it's interesting. So, you know, using the music metaphor, you know, there's a certain level of basic competence that's required to be successful, right? And, you know, for a musician, that's scales, arpeggios, music theory, reading the music, um, learning the basics. And while you're learning those things, you're not competent. You're you're on the way to being competent, but it takes, you know, the so-called 10,000 hour minimum to really be competent and really excel at something. So one of the expressions I like to use with my clients is um, excellence lies on the far side of discipline meaning you need to get through the discipline and the practice and the experience before you can actually demonstrate excellence. And, um, you know, it's not like, a, you know, the occasional garage band has a hit and that's really cool, but it doesn't usually last, right? They actually have to be competent in what they do. 
And the same with, with leadership and the same with organizations. They, they, they go through the same cycle. So uh, one of the things I've noticed from, from assessing all these organizations is that there's a basic lack of competence in our industry. And that doesn't mean people aren't doing good work. I mean, organizationally, we don't have world-class uh, or organizations like we have world-class sports teams. You know, we don't have the, the Mets and the Red Sox in most business. It isn't that kind of level of competence. Right. So I, tend to, I tend to focus on building competence with the basics. Like here's the basics that you need to, to execute and demonstrate on, you know, and do that for a while and then improve and, and move up. So the, the way I organized the book was, you know, here's the basics, you know, take one circle at a time and build your competency and practice those things and, you know, flex your muscles on, on doing gemba walks and, and, you know, running your own organization as an agile organization yourself and flex these muscles and then move to the second level and flex those muscles for a while. Mm-hmm. So really it's not unlike, you know, the advice you would give a music student or a, a someone who is, you know, going through a personal training regime, right. Or, or to getting a pilot's license, it's, you know, practice and learn and get competent. Um, I know, you know, people, when they think about piloting, they, you know, they think you're, you're sitting there steering the stick. But one of the things that surprised me about, about learning to be a pilot was that I had to become a meteorologist. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had no idea when I first started, you know, I thought, Oh, I'm going to go poke holes in the air. You know, it was going to be, and it is fun, Mm -hmm. but in order to get your license, you have to study and pass a very comprehensive meteorology exam. Which is Uh, fair enough, right? Lives are on the line. It's. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you're learning about all the cloud types and the heights and the winds and the, you know, to read the the report. And, and, um, but again, it's, it's this, this idea of a basic level of competence uh, that, that was really, really got me passionate about, Hey, we don't really have this in a lot of businesses. Right. Uh, And, you know, one of the, and I, and I think the, the, you know, the men and women that created the Agile Manifesto and, and, you know, did the initial work, obviously they're visionaries and they did amazing work, but one of the things they really didn't address was, was size. Right. And, and you know, one day I was, I was in a meeting last night and somebody said, well, the way we handle that is we always hire a players. <laughs> like, okay. Well, that's, that's cool that you have the luxury to do that, but you know, go to any 500 person organization and just the law of numbers tells us that we don't have all eight players. Right. Of course. Right. So, so what I tried to do in the book is create an, a framework, an ecosystem, a, a behavioral ecosystem that says, here's what competence looks like. Yeah. It's not, it's not a framework like safe or, or Nexus or any of those things. It's, it's a, it's a behavioral competency model. Mm-hmm. And it says, this is how, this is what I, what I think anyway, this is how competent organizations behave. And I chose agile as kind of the ecosystem. So the, I think, I think the way to use the book is to just, you know, start with leading, you start with the leading circle and build your competence up and then mm-hmm. spread, the, spread that out to the rest of the organization. So I would want to take the, the book and say, there's a bunch of those performance circles represent, as I said, those buckets to fill, but you want to fill them somewhat evenly. So you start at the, the rudiments level for each of them, because to fill one bucket to excellence or mastery won't serve you. Your big point is that these things are all codependent. Yeah, I, I was just what I meant by that was that, you know, we need to it starts with leadership, right? Of course. So, so, you know, what I advise, and, and there's a, there's an assessment model around here, around this and an organizational cert model around it, where we really focus on getting the leadership on board prior to, um, you know, prior to doing anything else. And, and this has worked uh, very well for us, especially in Asia. Uh, we have partners in China delivering APH assessments and training and, you know, leaders there are really command and control and, and very much top down, low trust. And this has really been, it's just a culture you know, issue there. That's just how they run their businesses. And um, so this has been super helpful for them. And the developers and the team members are really, really enjoying implementation. So we, we've, I think we've got about 20, 22 or 23 partners in, in uh, China delivering APH um, assessments and training and, and coaching services using the model that's in the book. Wow, that's incredible. 
And and you were you you brought up something about certifications too that I thought was interesting. Um, you know, obviously we've become certification crazy uh, in, in this country, and it's even it's even worse in Asia in terms of you know the, their focus on certs. And we're we're in a place now where anybody and everybody can create institute that offers certifications, right? Yeah. So you can get safe certified and you can get dad certified and you can get scrum certified by two different organizations. Right. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, it, a little bit, we, we wanted to a little bit align ourselves with that, but the individual certifications, I, I think I've really kind of gotten out of control a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the scrum Alliance did a great job at recruiting HR directors because uh, that seems to be, I mean, I don't, I'm not on the inside there, so I don't know this, but it seems to be a strategy that they've they've done a good job at at selling the value of the CSM to hiring managers. Right. And so you you see many many job openings now looking for uh, CSMs or or PSMs, and you know there's nothing wrong with taking a test. It's, I mean, if you want to do that, that's great. It's a free country. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you and I both know that the CSM test doesn't qualify you to be an effective scrum master though. Of course, of course. Because that, in my view, is something that requires, you know, very, very significant experience uh, dealing with people. Mm-hmm. Um, so you were, um, you do some of this, you do some coaching and you do, uh, you, you've got some meetups coming up. I think where you're going to be talking about some of these things, right? Mm-hmm. So I got one in, one in Toronto on May, I want to say it's the 8th, but I could have the date wrong. It's um, in early May. You can go to my website, badassagile.com, and find out about it there. Uh, the meetup is around the, you know, the art of becoming badass. So what are the qualities of that specific type of leader? And again, this is not so much the Dirty Harry character, but the actual things that I learned from Spec Ops teams, from my friends in the military, from from being in boxing, from being a musician? What are the different qualities that an emergent leader needs to take on um, in order to, to emerge and to, uh, frankly, self-authorize? There, there are times where if you're going to wait for your organization to understand self-organizing teams and pushing decisions down and flat hierarchies, you're going to wait forever. Right. So you want to affect change. Part of it leans on you being a change agent by doing in such a way that creates a shining example for others to at least be attracted to, if not follow. And delivering some early success through through repeated, calculated, and you know, a studied failure, quite frankly. So that requires courage. And it's not something that we teach. It's certainly not something that's in the Scrum Master School canon. Right. And furthermore, I would even go further, I wanna ask you about this, to my mind, think musician, think pilot once again, more important than planning is how well and thoroughly you're trained and practiced. So focusing on fundamentals and continuously repeating those things, because when crisis calls, especially in a flight situation, as you know, when, when, when any kind of disaster occurs in air flight, it is usually because the things that we have practiced incorrectly or instinctively react to somebody pulling back on the stick when you were supposed to push it when you start to stall. Those are the things that create disasters. In fact, there was one famous flight. I wish I could remember the, the, the flight number or the, um, the, the, uh, um, the vessel number, but it's a famous story where they had a, a set of procedures to follow and they started circling to execute those procedures and they avoided the disaster, but ran out of gas and crashed anyway. Right. I remember that. I can't remember what airline that was, but they got so focused on following the procedures that they... Exactly. It's some sort of electrical problem in a panel they were trying to solve, right? Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's interesting. So it, it's funny. I, I always say that software engineering is the, is the only kind of engineering that isn't engineering. And, <laughs> Good point. And it, it's, kind of a, it's kind of an inside joke for me, but... It, you know, in all of these industries, you know, flight, uh, aviation, music, um, many types of mechanical engineering, discipline and competency is like the the core the core thing that you really have to be good at. You have to be exactly. very disciplined. And you have to be very competent at what you do. And we don't have that. We don't seem to have that kind of passion in our industry 
uh, as much as I would like to see. Now, I, I'm very happy that that you know code craftsmanship's becoming a thing, and that's very cool that people are taking starting to take that seriously. You know, there, there was a great book written called Cold Crafts, Code Craftsmanship in the 90s that didn't get much traction um, that is now getting a lot. So that's terrific. Um, however, um, that's only one tiny piece of the puzzle, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what about competency in dealing with our customers? What about people management competency? What about business analysis competency? What about architecture competency? Yes, yes. We, we, we're, you know, this idea that it's code uh, is, is it's good. I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to throw cold water on it because I think it's great that they're taking it upon themselves to, to try to be better coders. But when you tell them that only about 5% of defects are caused by code problems, they're like, they look at you like, what? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, almost all defects in our business are caused by misunderstanding what the customer is asking us for. Got it. And um, nobody's talking about uh, requirements competency. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, to me, it's a no brainer is, is that's what we want to focus on. So this idea of, of discipline and competency is, is um, you know, obvious in so many industries, but not so obvious in ours. So that's what, that's what uh, I think we're both passionate about that. It sounds Absolutely. Like. And the problem that I'm really passionate about cracking these days, and let's just take a step back. Your website, agilecxo.org, if I'm not wrong. That's right. Yeah. Has a high degree of focus on governmental, on government. Sorry, I cut out there. Has a high degree of focus on governmental work. So you do work for big state government, and I assume for federal agencies as well. And right. and your resume is all online there. But but one of the problems you see in government quite frequently is the notion of siloed scrum teams, and the fact yeah. that even any big organization is going to struggle with. Here we are, as you know, either feature driven or heaven help us as layer driven teams. So either you have teams that are working on value streams or features, or you have teams that are like, this is the database team. This is the, right. team. but however they choose to organize it somewhere along the line, you have people who are like, well, I can't afford to have an architect sit on one or more scrum teams all day, every day. So what immediately starts to happen is that you have a lack of orchestration amidst all the scrum teams. You have people making right. architecture decisions and self-solving, which is great, but they're not aligned with what the team next door is doing, and they're definitely not aligned with any kind of enterprise vision or strategy. So you and I both know that people are going to pick up your book not from a place of starting the journey, yeah, which would be perfect, but from a place of it's broken, we don't yeah. understand how to fix it, and we have something that if we don't ship by you know, 8 to 12 weeks from now, we're all going to die. So how can you, how can your book help those people? Well, there's a, there's a couple of things. So we know that we know that most of the issues and problems have to do with, with literally uh, team members, not really understanding what their customers want. And that's a result of customers, not empowering people to be product owners or to speak for them. Um, More often than not, we see it surrogates as, um, you know, replacement product owners. Uh, We see teams that um, are not consistent. They're different, you know, people moving in and out. We see teams that are working on multiple projects at once. So one of the that I, that I really like to start with is uh, the simple notion of bringing the um, work to the team, not bringing the team to the work. Mm -hmm. This idea that, that, let's try some fixed teams that are properly integrated with the right roles and let's create a vertical, uh, what I call vertical values traceability, where we're, we're, we're practicing agile values from the team all the way up to the leadership. So by doing that, that implies that we have uh, a person in the business who's speaking for the, uh, for the products or the services. They are responsible for the ROI and the risk and they maintain one or more backlogs that go to one or more fixed teams mm-hmm. that they just bring work to. And that, that's a good, really good starting point. And it's a simple, you know, it's a simple idea. It's not simple, but not easy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, is take a look at the, um, some of the actions and ceremonies in the craftsmanship and teaming sections of the book where we focus on, on how to run a fixed long-term team that is successful. So I like to start with that. Um, 
they don't necessarily have to adopt any ceremonies or techniques that are in there. They can do it however they want to do it. But what I, what I do like to see is them starting to move towards this notion of, of bringing the work to the team rather than the team to the work, mm-hmm. because that helps avoid a lot of chaos and confusion um, in the organization. Um, I think the other, uh, the other thing that I think organizations that are broken need to start doing is uh, leadership needs to engage and and start observing what the teams are doing. Um, I was doing a uh, an assessment of a really big company that 1800 developers um, a couple of months ago and the leadership was proudly telling me about how agile they were and they're doing you know they're using planning poker and they're doing all the ceremonies and techniques and he had a scrum board on his wall so he kind of was he drank the kool-aid so to speak and he was into it but then we walked around we did a gumbo walk and we walked around for about three hours observing the teams and we couldn't find one team that was uh doing pair programming we couldn't find right. one team doing planning poker we couldn't find one team where the scrum master wasn't acting as a project manager so basically what was going on out in the field was was a perversion of what he thought was going on out in the field mm-hmm. and what the teams were telling him uh, right. was going on out in the field. And, and I don't mean to imply that, that teams are malicious or, or do anything wrong. This stuff evolves, right? Yeah. Behavior evolves. So it wasn't like the teams were saying, oh, let's let's tell them we're agile and let's just be chaotic. They, they weren't saying that. They were, it just had evolved over time. So the other thing that... Um, you know, I would say is if you're just getting started and trying to trying to fix broken problems is, you know, get out there and and do an inventory of the behaviors your teams are exhibiting. Yes. Mean, you might you might learn something, too. I mean, it isn't just a matter of them saying, oh, you, you're not doing what I thought you're doing it wrong. It's more a matter of, oh, you're, this is what you're doing. OK, and let's let's add that to our library of, of techniques that are useful to us. And let's, you know, let's get a real real good understanding of uh, what people are actually doing in our organization so that we can become experts. It's a, that notion of observation is really important to us. So disconnection between leadership and teams is a huge problem. And it sounds like that kind of philosophy could really help because at least they get to see how things actually are rather than how they're being reported. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons I, I created that section of, of 68 ceremonies is I was like, Hey, this is what you're looking for. This is what it looks like. I, I don't know if you've read the, um, here in the U S um, the defense innovation board just came out with a, a paper called, um, I know defense innovation board is kind of an oxymoron, but uh, <laughs> they came out with a, a white paper called how to spot agile BS. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and the Defense Innovation Board is a uh, is a quasi government agency that has within it Defense Department um, engineering people as well as commercial like like and I don't know exactly who the companies are but it's the Facebooks Apple you know, uh, Google and some of the big tech companies participate in this and they put out a paper because the the you know the reason this is an important conversation is the federal government is out telling ten billion dollars worth of suppliers uh, you need to be agile. Right. Right. So, of course, everybody's raising their hand and saying, you know, I'm, I'm agile. Where's the money? And um, so they put out this paper last year called How to Spot Agile BS. You got to read this. It's, it's a hoot. Uh, basically, the, the way you spot agile BS, according to the federal government, is if their stand ups aren't 15 minutes, mm-hmm. if um, their sprint demo doesn't produce a piece of implementable code at the end of two weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, all of these kind of very, uh, I don't know, sort of very re- demonstrating very, sur- very much a surface understanding of the meaning yep. of the techniques and ceremonies, mm-hmm. not a whisper about leadership, not a whisper about values that I, that I could get out of the report, not, you know, no focus on culture, um, just are they, if they're, here's the, how they do the techniques wrong and you need to fix this. Right. So, so it's like. The negating of whatever's in the scrum guide or whatever's in the agile philosophies, the negative of that is the, the, the behavior to watch for. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I think that it's important that leaders get out there and they, they, um, they look and they understand exactly what's going on in their organization. But, you know, I think the responsibility for culture and, and being agile 
really falls very heavily on leadership shoulders. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't have written a paper that kind of put, put it on the team shoulders as much, although the team has responsibility, obviously, but you know, an agile organization needs to have an infrastructure that supports self-organization. Right. And, and people, People always ask us, you know, you probably get this question a lot. Um, how do I scale Agile? How do I make Agile big? And I always say, that's the wrong question. The question is, how do you scale self-organization? Exactly. Right. And when you think it through, if you reverse engineer, what does it take? Well, they need some governance mechanism. They, they need competency models. They need examples of, of expected behavior. They need, they need guide rails. They need... They need tools and, and, you know, the things that they need to do their job. There's all kinds of stuff in there. It doesn't happen. You know, it isn't like a unicorn comes down from, you know, a mountain in Utah with, you know, a bunch of guys on the back saying, you shall now be agile. It doesn't work that way. Right. One of the things I always, sorry to interrupt, but one of the things I always preach and teach is that if you want to scale agile, don't think transformation because to start with the end in mind of, the organization, the organization has to wipe clean their current practices and move instead to agile practices. This is the fundamental question of why do you want agile and what do you think it's going to do for you? So I always say you should start with willing minds and projects that fit. So if you want an easier time working with agile, find agile people who are aligned for the right reasons, who are willing, at least in your opinion or your exploration, who look like they're willing to make the required mindset changes. That includes enabling people. That includes moving trust downward. Find those people. And then don't forget to work with projects that fit. So if you have highly complex projects that are already in trouble with vendors that won't play agile ball with you, you're, you're setting yourself up to do the heavy lift first, which is you know, if you're trying to build muscle, you don't start with the impossible lift. It might be tempting, but it's not really going to help you. Right. Yeah, I like the idea of really just starting small like you were describing. but you know, what would you say is, what are some of the tip-offs that you've seen in leadership that, that really they're not going to be able to adopt Agile? You know, everybody's, everybody's talking about adopting Agile, and I hear this, all my teams here, we're doing a lot of Agile here, we're, we're, using, we're using some Agile-like things here, you know, we're, we're trying to be a little more Agile, uh, you've heard all of these expressions. Uh, what are some of the tip-offs that you see that you know, tell you, well, these, these people just aren't going to be able to get this right. For me, everything depends on reason. So I have a saying that your reason for doing everything matters more than anything. So if I'm speaking to somebody, they can't tell a compelling story about why they would want to go with agility. So if they don't fundamentally believe that there's got to be a better way, like think of where agile came from. It came from a bunch of people sitting around saying, this sucks. There has to be a better way. Right. Value into the paying customer's hands sooner. If you can't see that as a starting point, you've missed the point. Right. So organizations that say we must be agile, you know, I have some customers who know they need to become more agile, but they can't articulate why and how you measure that. Right. So nothing gets done, not surprisingly. And, and that's not a critique. It's just there's no really good information out there about why you should become agile and how you go about spreading agility short of a framework. So it all, it all seems to presuppose that you want to go agile, don't you? That's just the modern way. Like if you're, if you're water, right. you're, you're heading towards extinction, but I don't think that's true. Yeah, I, I, think so. yeah. Yeah. I think that you want to adopt agility because fundamentally a better way to put products in customers' hands. If you can't put customer value in customers' hands sooner, you can no longer compete. So if you call yourself innovative, then you must be able to demonstrate that you can pivot and turn and try things with customers because that's what they want. That's what they expect now. If, on the other hand, your customers are okay with a year and a half runway, I always give the example of when I was coming up, there was Windows 95, then there was Windows 98, so three years in between a right. big product increment. Then it was Windows 2000, so I shortened to two years. Now we're at the point where Instagram or Facebook ship every week. Right. So obviously, the customer demand landscape has changed, and if you don't believe that the Agile principles support getting customer value out there sooner then you might have missed the point. But let's not forget, it creates happier, higher performing teams too. This pushing decisions down, 
allows people to feel empowered in what they do. It allows them to say, this is the life that I choose. These are the values that I want to bring to my work environment. This is the contribution that I want to make. By insisting on hierarchical, top-down decision-making, you steal that from people. So what I love about the emergent leadership model that I love talking about is that it allows people to come forward and say, I want to make a contribution here. I want to do things differently. And Agile is a platform to do that with. So when you talk to leaders and they can't tell that story, I feel like they might be disconnected from their customers and disconnected from their people. And to my mind, those are the biggest tip-offs. Yeah, you said something really interesting there that resonated with me. And you, you talked about, you know, if you want to adopt agility, you didn't say adopt Agile. Right. Uh, and, and I love that because, you know, we hear, we hear a lot of leaders say, oh, we're going to adopt Agile. And immediately, you know, they're talking about Scrum. Right. Or they're saying, we're going to adopt Agile. We're going to do stand-ups. We're going to do this. And then you're like, well, why do you want to adopt Agile? And, you know, if they can't articulate it. But I think the way you describe that. So tell, what's the fundamental difference in your mind between agility and, and let's just say the market perception of Agile? So here's what I, I'm going to answer this in a roundabout way. I like to do what's called a four minute mile exercise, which the, the principle behind is the four minute mile was considered an unbreakable ceiling until one person broke it, at which point anyone could do it. And when I do exercises with new teams, I actually prefer that they're not development teams. I prefer working with human resources or learning and development or marketing or organizations that have nothing to do with code and saying, let's look at four problems that seem impossible to solve or impossible to solve quickly. And I want you to choose the one that would have the greatest impact if we could solve it. And then we sit in the room and in 20 minutes we brainstorm it, then we dot vote to pick the most important one. Then we start thinking of solutions. Solutions that might be impossible, but if we were empowered to do anything we wanted, what would we do, could we do to fix it? Then I asked them to create the next three to five steps to move the dial forward. So within an hour time frame, we come up with experiments. Experiments that prove that we could make a difference in a way that we previously thought impossible. To my mind, that's agile. That's agility. Right. Adopting agile is going and taking the, the, the scrum master course, the product owner course, and all of those things, and then implementing and forcing on people right. these frameworks and roles with the expectation that that will bring the desired result. But Agile is not a methodology. It's not meant to be that way. So to my mind, the four-minute mile exercise is what gets people thinking with agility, that all of a sudden the impossible is in fact possible if you're just willing to change your mindset, to try experiments, be willing to fail, and to move forward in the face of uncertainty. That's what, I, that's what agility means to me. Well, that's fabulous. And you didn't mention Scrum once in that whole... Well, in that whole explanation. So that's terrific. No, By the no. Way, Scrum provides what I call rails, meaning that yeah. to be pedantic about Scrum ceremonies might be missing the point. Rather to say, gathering on a frequent basis, right now in waterfall methodology, we have something called a post-mortem. And post-mortem is examining your mistakes so you can get better, but it's also Latin for after you're dead, which is the right. wrong time to make improvements. Right. So retrospectives, for better or worse, provide a mechanism for people to self-inspect, examine with open and honest communication and examination so that they can make small incremental improvements on a path to mastery, which you'll never reach. Right. I don't care how you do that. I don't care if you call it Scrum or not Scrum, but Scrum has already got a playbook, which if you try it has been well tested and has got some cool techniques that we can use as sure. long as we understand it's ours to adapt, which is again, what I love about Great Big Agile, your book. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. So that, that, that's really cool. By the way, it was Sir Roger Bannister, I think, who broke that's the That's the name. Thank, thank yeah, you. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure what year where you're born, born, but I was running track around that time and he was kind of a... Uh, he was the big name. He was the big name. Okay. But uh, hey, one, one more thing I wanted to ask you about. I, I, I just kind of wanted to get your opinion on this. I was talking with someone the other day and they kept using the phrase lean and agile and we're adopting lean and we're adopting agile. I said... Mm -hmm. Well, that's super interesting because my, my perception of, of Agile values has always been that uh, fail fast was one of the more important things mm -hmm. um, in the lexicon that, you know, 60 to 70% of technology projects or maybe more in some cases 
don't end up the way we expect them to and, and are right. thought, thought of to be failures. And that agile is, you know, adopting agile means we're going to fail fast and we're going to find out quickly uh, and keep the cost of failure low, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I often tell clients, you know, this stuff was invented uh, in, for one reason was to reduce the cost of failure because we know we're going to fail. So it's this notion of we acknowledge failure versus uh, there's no room for failure, right? Right. Um, so that you can have a whole conversation on that subject, but, yeah. but it, it always, lean always strikes me as, as a way to optimize every part of the process to eliminate failure, um, uh, and to increase the chances that we won't have failure mm-hmm. up front. It seems like there's a conflict there that mm-hmm. one says, uh, this is a model that exposes failure early and allows us to correct it. And the other model is uh, we're going to work like heck with a Six Sigma black belt and we're going to identify all these failure points and optimize them. It seems like there's some conflict there. What do you think? I, I agree totally. I, I'm a big proponent that certainty costs and delivers. So it costs a lot and delivers little. The price of seeking certainty through prior examination, through hypothesizing without actual testing in order to feel confident enough to move forward, because what happens in big business? They require that you create a business case that promises some benefit for some degree of cost. Right. The way I describe it is this, how long would it take you uh, to move from where you are right now to your front door? You could tell me with some precision that it's probably about six seconds. Fantastic. How long would it take you to walk from where you are rather to your front door instead to Dallas, Texas? Now here, the number's a little bit more fluid. You'd give me an estimate that's probably off by order of magnitude, 2x, 10x, some number like that. Why can you be so certain about the things that are like the, the, the front door estimate, but not so certain about walking to Dallas? Because walking your front door is small, less complex, easier to visualize, and you've probably done it a million times before. If you've never walked to Dallas, you have nothing empirical to go on. So to try to create estimates and certainty around something you've never done before so that we can reduce failure to my mind, is a wasteful effort in and of itself. So if you want to be truly lean, I think the exercise of seeking certainty is itself wasteful. Right. So what I love about lean, especially lean startup, is the idea of iterating fast. Yes, we try to plan for, we try to study. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing a focus group and trying to figure out what might work before we execute. I think you should always narrow your path. Don't, Don't run experiments that are foolish. But at the same time, to try to understand and control the environment so well, as you know, in flight, everything is random. Right. So at what point it's great to, like you mentioned understanding weather so that you can look for signs and symptoms of a continuously changing and moving environment. That's wonderful. But even a weatherman with all of their science and technology still can't tell you for sure if you should bring an umbrella today or not. That's the truth. Right. I always remember that scene from, uh, uh, what's, what's the movie with uh, the space movie? Um, gosh, I, I keep wanting to say a few good men, but that's not right. It, uh, but anyway, they're famous space movie where they, they're in the, they're in the, you know, the tower and they're looking at all this fancy weather gear. And the, the reporter says, uh, Hey, uh, what is the best tool you have for predicting the weather? And the, and the guy gets up and he points out the window. Exactly. It's, you know, look at, Looking out here, the right stuff. That was the name of that. The right stuff. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. When you study with guys who are special operations, you wouldn't think you spend a lot of time doing, you know, anti-masculine things like yoga, meditation, and working on intuition, but it's actually one of the most important parts of their development. And they all have stories to tell about times where they were walking around in the field of combat or even practice, and something in their heads told them to stop walking. And seconds later, a bullet whizzes by that had they kept moving would have made direct impact. There's just, there's, there's that, that extra layer. There's that, you know, almost undefinable level of instinct that we don't foster in people. So instead we try to replace it with systems, with processes, with, you know, examination rituals that I think are costly. And at the end of the day, don't service or increase our chances in all cases. Yeah, and, and it's just um, super interesting that you know, some of the really big companies, and, and I work a lot with the government, but also with a lot of defense contractors, and you know they're kind of stuck in this you know process slash bureaucratic mode of operations, 
where just the way they run their business means that they can't do that, right? They can't develop people in the way you just described because everything's focused around process. And, you know, they have teams of people who are responsible for the process, which of course is a disaster, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've got people who aren't actually doing the work, telling people how to do the work. Yeah. So it's a, it's a mess. And, and the problem that, and one of the reasons I wrote the book was that, uh, cause I see this as like this coming tidal wave, right? The, the federal government, the DOD, but also companies like General Motors and Ford and Chrysler and, and, you know, Lockheed Martin and Boeing, they're all telling their suppliers, we want you to be agile. Right. Uh, but at the same time, there are many of them, some of them do, but many of them are not providing competent product owners if they have product owners at all um they're they're throwing you know 300 page requirements specs at the supplier still they're Mm -hmm. asking for three dates out 18 months you know so what does it mean when when about 30 billion dollars a year is being spent on software product development uh, with a desire for the companies to be agile but they're doing these kinds of things to to basically you know sabotage them right right so what does that mean for the industry it means that we're going to see these hybrid frameworks and they're already the software engineering institutes already working on this unfortunately these sort of hybrid frameworks that give the government and the big corporations everything they want but ask teams to perform agile ceremonies right so it's 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 a bad thing and so one of the reasons i wrote the book is because i was just alarmed by this and i was like oh hold on a second this is going to take us backwards and we need to get in front of this you know there's a certain almost nobody wants to hear this but there's an adapt or die philosophy that's kind of running undercurrent at all times where it's like if you don't want to get this if you if you think that the path forward the way to respond to the changing landscape is to do what you've always done but sprinkle a couple of scrummy ceremonies on top of it right there's no law saying you have to survive or exist in the future ask kodak ask blockbuster and it's not because they were stupid it's because they failed to make the right choices and the right evolutions at the right time right and it's just the nature of survival of the fittest there will always be a pairing off kind of process and, and you in your book you bring up a great point that your model emulates nature rather than man-made structures and hierarchies in practice right Nature has a burning off or a sloughing off process as well. Forest fires are designed to get rid of the dead wood so that a new growth can emerge organically. There's nothing saying that your business has to survive. But if you wish to, especially in the innovation space, then you're going to have to take a serious look at these mindsets and be prepared to throw away the old ways of thinking. Yeah, you know, it's, and it's, it's two or 3,000 years worth of culture. Right. Because if you look at the way, you know, at least in North America, business operates, and I know in Asia, it's even worse problem is, you know, we're basically emulating the, the management model of, of the Roman legions. Right. Right. So it's exactly we structure businesses exactly the way Julius Caesar structured his army and, and actually the Greeks before him even. So Alexander right. the Great structured his army the way IBM is structured. Awesome. And, and again, what's so important about going back to your book once more is that you don't have to take this. So many people are going to pick up a book like this and they're going to, they're going to treat it biblically. Like I right. start page one and I must, we read the great works of history, like you just mentioned, or philosophy, so that we have the breadth of knowledge. We can learn from other people's experience. We can mirror and match models that have existed previously to help us see a way forward. So I want the listeners to take this book and not follow it page by page, but to use it as a, a like, almost like a well of not only information, like I said, you have that beautiful back half of the book, which is here are all of the practices. Here's the outcomes you're looking for. And here are the general steps on how to do it well. But the front half of the book is simply a way of looking at the organization and evolution of things in a progressive way, which to me is perfectly natural, right? A tree doesn't go from a sapling to a giant oak overnight. It just doesn't work that way. Right. To treat your agile evolution as exactly that is so important. But if we continue to do things the way we have historically done them, you're going to keep getting the kinds of outcomes that you've always gotten. Right. You're totally right on about that. I think a lot of people miss the, 
you know, the organizational, I hate to use the word maturity because it's so heavily loaded in our industry with capability and maturity models and things like that. But, but conceptually, those folks were right in that organizations grow just like individuals do. Yes. And I always use uh, the metaphor of, you know, if, I don't know if you have children or not, but <laughs> so, you know, if you have a, if you have a two-year-old child and you say, you know, completely clean your room before you come down for dinner, you know, you're going to go back up there in an hour and they're going to be playing with all their stuff all around them. Right. <laughs> if you tell a 12 year old to do it, they're going to, you know, throw stuff in the closet and, you know, make an attempt and at least, you know, make the floor, the floor clear. Yeah. And if a 25 year old does it, you know, hopefully they're, you know, they're going to have a spick and span type of neat environment. Right. Uh, that you can't force the two year old to be a 25 year old by sending them to a certification class. Exactly right. Right. So I think this idea of, of actual maturing of an organization is lost on, on all of these models. And so what, what I wanted to do was say, here's a, I'm, I'm going to call it a behavioral maturing uh, model I guess here's here's the evolutionary path that will you know if you take your time and and get and become competent at each one of these levels before moving on to the next one, then you'll grow organically. Yes, to the people into the organization you want to be. Awesome. Have you yet encountered an organization who's been able to take this on and create as as a result and enviable culture, like a place where it's like, it is awesome to work here. The people love it. The customers can feel it. The leadership is in lockstep with these kinds of principles and philosophies. Are there any organizations, I know you can't always name names, but do you have examples of customers and how they behave? Like what are the hallmarks or the benchmarks that you can see? Yeah. You know, uh, there, there are a few and, and I, I can't name names, but, um, there's one organization we've been working with for some time that had two major um, divisions in their company. One dealt with healthcare, one dealt with government. And of course, in 2010, government and healthcare, at least here in the U.S., became the same thing in some ways. And these two organizations were viciously competing and fighting with one another. They, They literally... Uh, you know, weren't communicating with each other. They were, they were having a terrible, terrible culture. And, you know, we went through a process with them over a period of years to, this is before I wrote the book, but to implement some of the ideas. And um, I was just talking, this about five years ago, I was just talking to the CEO yesterday and he said, you know what? You made us one company. You made it a cool place to work. Wow. And, uh, you know, we're all on the same page and we, you know, people move between organizations now because all these behaviors are, are, everybody understands it because we created a a competency set um, around agility that allows everybody to interact uh, positively. So that was a, it was a great testimonial um, that he said, we made them one company, which, or he, he he, they made themselves one company, but we were honored to be part of the process anyway. And, and let me ask you a question. Why do you do what you do? This is normally a question I'd lead off with, but it, it almost sounds like there's some, there's some benefit or there's some um, fulfillment for you in not getting people agile, not producing more software, better quality software quicker, but rather in helping large organizations, governmental organizations be better. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, you'll understand this because you're a musician and, and uh, this is the kind of thing I don't usually say to my clients because they look at me sideways. Right. But uh, when I walk into a new company, I see in my mind's eye um, a poor symphony orchestra with great potential. Right. So I see, you know, and I just, just, I really literally, I'm like, okay, there's, there's these different sections. There's the cello section here and the woodwind section here, and they're not playing together. They're not working together. They're not confident. They're not disciplined, but they could be, and they could be awesome. So I always like to say, you're not, you know, you're not awesome yet, but you could be. Of course. And, and some, obviously some are awesome already, but um, so I, I like, I see this sort of orchestra, you know, on a stage with, that needs help. They need, right. they need 
help, but they don't need control. So like an orchestra conductor, a lot of people don't understand what an orchestra conductor does, but an orchestra conductor is an operator of a self-organizing infrastructure. Right. They're the steward of the architecture. They're not controlling uh, the players. The players are so far beyond discipline and competency that they don't (laughs) need direction. What they need is is someone to operate the infrastructure. And that's exactly what I am interested in doing is helping companies build a behavioral infrastructure that lets them be awesome on their own. Right. Regardless of framework or model, I I have waterfall clients that are great companies and that's okay. I'm cool with that. Right, right, right. Um, But I want them to be competent and disciplined and let then they'll learn and they'll choose and they'll know exactly what's right for them once they get to that point of performance. Awesome. Awesome. It's, it's not, it sounds like you have some of the same passion. I do. I'm, I, I love making people great. I love seeing people who are in lockstep with their purpose and working in jobs where they can fulfill that purpose. You know, there are so many people, if you walk around on the streets and, the, and they appear, you know, I live in Toronto. Toronto's a big city. And when you walk around, so many people are frowning and looking down at their feet. And if you ask them what they do, they tell you what their job is, but they don't tell you what they were put on this earth to achieve. And unlocking that. So I have a vision statement. I always, I'm happy to repeat it. And it's pretty simple. And it's, I create art. And to me, the the coaching event, the one-to-one coaching, the podcast, all of those things to me are miniature works of art. So to create works of art that connect and ignite people to reach their highest performance and fulfillment and to create lives of distinction, strength, and simplicity. And finally to create heroes. So it's about maximizing people for their own self. Everyone has a different resonant frequency. Uh, You can't play a violin part on an oboe. It just doesn't work. Right. So there's each of us have a certain, you know, almost uh, destiny is not the right word, but each of us is meant to do something particular. Your parents have been telling you you were great at it since you were a kid. It's something you always return to. It's something you've always done well. And all experiments to the contrary will fail because there was something that you were meant to do for whatever reason. Nobody has to teach an ant how to carry a grain of sand. They just do it. It's plugged right. into the DNA and helping people find that. That's how you 10X or 20X people. That's how you get true agility is to get people to mate their value, the things that they value, the value they want to create in the universe to the value of your customer or your company. Once you find a way to have your values serve the values of your customer or your client, now you're onto something. And that's what high performers look like. Well, that's terrific. You know, I I definitely want to introduce you to Jim Bouchard. He has a podcast also called Walking the Walk that you might find interesting. Okay. Um, but I, I think the three of us are, uh, you know, we ought, to, we ought to do a road show because we're, it seems like we're really locked in on the types of things that are important. And I think you'd really enjoy um, hearing from Jim as well. So I'll, I'll make an introduction. But uh, I want to say, are you, in the, are you in the Detroit for the, uh, the Agile Conference in Detroit in May? I am speaking at, you're talking about um, Agile and Beyond? Yep. Yeah, I'll be speaking, actually. Are you going to be there? I'll be there as well. I'm speaking also. Oh, good. So we'll have a chance to meet in person. And uh, do you know know what day you're speaking yet? I want to say it's the middle day, the 30th. Thursday, right. Yeah. And so I'm going to be speaking in the morning, and um, I'll need to leave because I'm heading to Japan that night. Okay. So, but I will be there Wednesday and Thursday yep. till noon. So let's definitely connect. Same here. I'll be there the Wednesday. So we'll, uh, we'll find a way to get together. All right. Well, Chris, I think we're out of time. This was a fantastic conversation and you're, um, I'm really, uh, I'm really impressed with what you're doing and I, I love your site and, um, there's an awful lot behind, behind your Twitter feed and your, and your site. You've done a lot of thinking about this. Obviously it's uh, very impressive stuff. Thank you, sir. And likewise, I am loving this book and I'm telling everyone they have to get a copy and start using it. This is the kind of thing that you put this in your arsenal and it's an empowering tool. It is, it's a, it's a lexicon. It is, and it's also a way of thinking about the problem that we're all trying so hard to solve. So this is required reading. This is evolutionary stuff. 
So you can put down your scrum guide for a while and pick this up. <laughs> I think this really, really can help people to evolve organizations towards better agility. I love the book. Thank you for writing it. Hey, my pleasure. And thank you for reading it. And thank you for the, uh, you know, the nice, the nice words and the kind words about it. It's really, um, I, you know, you know how the folks in the agile community tend to be fairly vocal. Yeah. Um, and I, I, uh, you know, when I published the book, I kind of like, you know, when I pushed the button on send, I kind of closed my eyes and said, oh, my gosh, I, I hope I don't get, you know, <laughs> blasted by, you know, some of the big names in Agile. But actually, the feedback's been pretty decent. So um, I'm uh, glad it has. But isn't it funny? We have to do it anyway. That's the thing. Yeah. If Agile teaches you one thing. It's to leap and to say the opinions of, of, of others is nobody's business but theirs. You have to put your work out there because, and this is true for everyone listening, because when you reach 100 people, 10 of them will notice, two or three of them, you'll change their lives forever. And that's, I'm guessing, why we do what we do. Right. I think you're right about that. Well, thank you very much, Chris Williams. Uh, AgileBadass.com is your website, I think. Is that right? That's the one. And the meetup is on May 8th. And quick note, you can go to meetup.com and look for Toronto Agile Leadership. You'll find the, the group there. And we'll also be live streaming it on Instagram. So follow at Badass Agile, one word, no spaces. And Jeff, you are agilecxo.org. That's right, yeah. And the book is Great Big Agile, an OS for Agile Leaders. And it's published by A Press. I got mine on Amazon, so you can too. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks, Chris, in Detroit. Yes, sir. Brother Jeff, thanks for the time, man. This was a great conversation. Yeah, thank you. Goodbye. Have a nice night. Cheers. You too. Bye-bye.